Okay, so along the uh, lines of outreach, uh, I'm going to talk about my trip in December to uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia with Dr. Bernstein, and we were working on improving the retinal care in that region. So um, we'll just get right into it here. I do have to put up this disclaimer. All the residents have seen this every, week, every two weeks at Florescene, but these are my views only. This does not represent Department of Defense or Department of the Navy policy or any opinion. And go Navy. Rah. So if anybody needs caffeine, <laughs> now's the time, all right? Uh, Funny picture, obviously. Um, we were, uh, this was after a long day on uh, day seven. We had a pretty hectic schedule and we had flown out from uh, a small airport at about, I think about 7 a.m., gotten into the next airport at about 8.15, picked up immediately, driven right to hiking for probably, oh, I don't know, four or five miles. Um, with lots of picture taking and then this was the first chance to relax in quite a while and we were both just hanging out across from each other on this empty uh, be, uh, empty uh, spot on a veranda and there was a lull in the conversation and then I looked up and <laughs> Dr. Bernstein had just decided to uh, slip off so if anybody needs one go get some caffeine here and we'll just get going. So Ethiopia this is obviously Ethiopia it is uh, the large, or the, excuse me, the, the uh, second most populous um, country in Africa, and it is the most populous landlocked country in the world. So that I found interesting. It wasn't always landlocked. Uh, if you guys know much about uh, the history of this area, Eritrea used to be a part of Ethiopia um, until the Italians came in the mid 1900s. So obviously, we were in Addis which is in the center there. That's the most recent capital for uh, the last 70 so uh, some odd years. And prior to that, it was up north. So we spent most of our time in Addis, and then we spent a little bit of time in the north um, seeing some sites, and I'll show you a few pictures of that too. So the demographics of the country, again, 87.9 million people. That's as of 2014, and it's growing at about a 3 to 4% annual clip. Uh, again, uh, interestingly, and they're very proud of this fact, it's the only country never to have been conquered by a European power in Africa. And for that reason, many of the African countries, when they gained independence, actually took the colors of the Ethiopian flag and used them on their flags. So that's why there's so much green, yellow, and red in African flags. Um, and they've had, a, this is the most recent flag, but they've had about 30 some odd flags in the last 100 years. They just keep changing it. Um, it's about twice the size of Texas and there are four retina specialists. So that demonstrates the need to be here. Um, and there are a few other ophthalmologists and some other, uh, all these four retina specialists are in Audis and there are some uh, comprehensive ophthalmologists who do limited retinal services such as lasers or scleral buckles. Um, but, uh, you can see that's uh, relatively low, considering we have six retina specialists here in Salt Lake, just in, at the Moran, not including all the uh, other folks. So the state of medical care, there's 13 medical schools in the country, but that's relatively recent. Um, as of about six or seven years ago, the, uh, the country really upped the number of medical schools and the number of applicants that they accepted to medical schools. Um, because they had a lot of trouble with these quality physicians that they were training at the few medical schools all leaving the country, coming over to the states or to Europe and practicing. And so no doctors were really staying there. Um, and because of that, they, uh, they really upped the number. And uh, the, the problem with that was that some of the trainees were of lower quality or questionable quality. Most of the schools in the country, um, the primary schools all teach in Amharic, which is the native language. But then in the secondary schools, everything's taught in English. However, even some of the residents that we were teaching knew pretty minimal English. Uh, certainly weren't able to speak very well, which is 
is a challenge. It's nice that they have the bodies that they need to start actually filling the ranks of the doctors, um, but the level at which they're able to be trained is maybe somewhat questionable right now, but uh, that's the trade-off the government's making at this time. Um, even despite that, most of Ethiopians live without a doctor because they live in small rural villages and may never end up leaving that village for their entire life. The government hospitals are obviously notoriously low uh, resource, and uh, they really do have a lack of quality training. And part of that is because there's no incentive to be an academic clinician. There's no incentive, uh, significant incentive to work at the uh, government hospital and teach other than for the love of teaching. So it's, uh, it's difficult to train and keep people. The retinal care, again, four retinal specialists, all of them are in Addis. Um, two of them work at the Menelik II Government Hospital, which is where we spent a decent amount of our time. And then there are two private clinics in, in the city. Um, the Dr. Talixu, he did his, uh, he's the longest um, retina specialist there, and he did his tra hands-on training at or with Orbis. Um, and then he also did an obser observational fellowship here in 2016, and he did uh, an observational fellowship as well at, uh, um, in California. So he's pretty well trained. He does full-scale retina service. Um, the second one that we worked with a lot was Dr. Dereje, who also works at, uh, at Menelik, and he had some training in the Dominican Republic on laser and buckles, and he's just started to have some uh, vitrectomy skills and those Dr. Talixu is pretty much teaching him uh, how, to, how to do vitrectomy. And it was exciting, we got to help him further his skills. And then uh, uh, Dr. Alamu also did a, a year training at Tilganga and then did an observational fellowship out here to further refine his skills. So he had his hands-on training out in Nepal. Um, and we'll talk about that later as in terms of the goals and things we want to accomplish. Uh, coming up. There's one other retina specialist that we don't have any contact with who works with Dr. Alamo that we kind of know nothing about. So Menelik II, they normally have rent a clinic two half days a week. Um, the residents pretty much only observe, um, so that kind of makes it a little bit interesting. Uh, you can see the, the photo there in the bottom that they have the two observer scopes and the um, the attending really never gets up from that chair and they just bring a patient in. He takes a look, he kind of describes things, he tells them what they need and then they move on. So they're able to be pretty efficient um, and they can see you know, upwards of 50 patients in a half day without, without a huge problem. Um, they don't have any OCT, they don't have any photo capabilities, they have no laser and they have no ultrasound. So those are all major issues. It's really just ophthalmoscopy that they're doing. Um, they also don't use the indirect uh, uh, ophthalmoscope unless they're laying the patient down. So, um, you know, so pretty much the, we, so we did indirect on, I think, four patients that day, and all of them we had to, they bring them into another room, the residents lay them down, they get you, they get on the indirect. So um, we're, we're going to go also go into kind of teaching them that you can do indirect while someone's sitting up relatively quickly and easily um, and kind of help further some of the, the skills there. So they do surgery, uh, retina surgery, two half days a week as well. They have an Ortley vitrectomy machine, which is a European uh, company. It's a pretty difficult interface. It's not very user friendly, um, but the upside is, is they do have many reusable pieces. Most of the tubing is reusable um, and they, can, they reuse the cutters um, and uh, most of the equipment is reusable. So not much gets thrown away which is really nice. You can see the OR there in the lower right, um, me doing a buckle, teaching one of the residents, and then Dr. Tilixu and uh, Bernstein in the OR. So what were our goals? Our goals were to train and improve the retina skills of the attendings currently there, develop interest in the residents um, and teach the residents while we were there, um, initiate a possible collaborative research project, um, and uh, Dr. Bernstein has been working with uh, Dr. Talixu and talking about AMD and the fact that they see a reasonable amount of AMD in, in Ethiopia more than kind of would be expected or certainly with the classic teaching of f uh, people of African descent. Um, bring a bunch of much needed supplies 
for vitrectomy and buckles. They were running very low on any buckles and they were pretty much using it just one type of sponge as their only buckle that they had. And then assess for ongoing needs and kind of create a, a plan to improve, continue to improve things. So day one, we pretty much arrived. We brought tons of supplies. I think it was, uh, you know, multiple thousands of dollars, I think in the $20,000 range in terms of PFO. Um, we brought a lot of uh, non-reusable equipment in the U.S. that they can reuse and sterilize, forceps, scissors, um, uh, even entry systems that they will that they will reuse over and over again. Um, and then uh, they also had a bunch of 23 gauge vitrectomy probes that were stuck in customs for about, they'd been stuck for about two months because some paperwork didn't go through. And that's one of the frustrating things about Ethiopia is that uh, the paperwork is very, very challenging. And if it's not done right the first time, the government will just sit on it forever and it goes down into this oblivion. So we were lucky enough to stay with this nice gentleman, uh, Tekle, and he is uh, a pastor who is running an NGO um, for, uh, for young girls, um, teaching, uh, basically rehabilitating them in the north. And uh, we met him through a generous patient that Dr. Bernstein and I had probably about a month before we left for Ethiopia. Um, we had a patient who needed a pneumatic retinopexy and he just so happened to work at an NGO in uh, Ethiopia and knew this man and said, hey, would you guys like to stay with a nice person you've never met rather than stay at the hotel? And uh, both of us jumped at the chance, so we were lucky enough to have a good guide and a, a very nice man take care of us while we were there. So day two, we went over to Menelik, uh, to, and Dr. Bernstein talked about retinal degenerations with the residents for, for a, an hour lecture in the morning. And this was followed by a very busy clinic. Um, saw about 35 patients in two hours with Dr. Dereja. And uh, most of the patients in the clinic had bilateral advanced pathology, you know, total retinal detachment for multiple years in one eye and a total retinal detachment in the other eye. So about three quarters of them were le led into the room because they couldn't see the chair um, or bilateral vitreous hemorrhages, things of that nature. Um, and more diabetic retinopathy than I think, uh, certainly than I expected to see there. And you can see all the patients just waiting outside the clinic to come in and have their turn. So day three, uh, we were back at Menelik, and we did, I did a one-hour diabetic uh, retinopathy talk because we'd seen so much the previous day for the residents. And then we did half a day retina clinic uh, with Telexu, and we saw 45 or so patients that day. Um, that's a picture of all the residents who were uh, there for, that, uh, for the uh, lecture in the morning. Um, that's outside the, uh, the lecture hall, and then the uh, only eye bank of Ethiopia was right there, and it was a one room, but uh, they did a pretty good job of obtaining tissue, surprisingly. So, um, and then we went over to Dr. Talixu's private clinic and saw about 60 patients and looked at uh, many <coughs> patients with AMD, and uh, Dr. Bernstein was looking at a lot of those patients, seeing if there was a different phenotype or, or anything that uh, could possibly be studied and trying to kind of assess for, um, for future studies with some of these patients. They do have an OCT at, that, at, uh, at the private clinic as well as a laser and, and an OR. So it's, uh, it's much better equipped and anybody who they see at the government hospital who requires OCT or possible injections, AMD patients, they all have to be sent out to the private clinic and, and pay uh, for that service. So. Hopefully we can, we can change that in the future. So day four, we were in the OR with Dr. Dereja in the morning, and uh, it's Dr. Dereja doing a buckle here on the, uh, on the upper left, and then uh, me doing a vitrectomy for a uh, total RD um, with Dr. Dereja watching, and then it was exciting. We got to have Dr. Dereja peel his first epiretinal membrane. Um, uh, under Dr. Bernstein's and my w watching eyes, trying to help him learn that skill. And uh, he did a great job. It was a 2200 membrane, so it was nice and thick and easy to, to peel and get. And uh, um, we're hoping that he can come do an observership in the future. And then me doing a buckle, teaching the residents. And um, interestingly, they do their buckles just under, completely under direct, uh, uh, indirect ophthalmoscope. And um, 
Also, uh, Dr. Derege, his interesting technique for cryotherapy, he actually drains the subretinal fluid so the eye is really soft and pushes, just looks without the indirect and pushes in until he sees the tear inside the pupil and then hits the cryo. So, interesting way to do it. Not the, we, 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 I, I, we showed him the way that we did it and uh, hopefully he'll, he'll decide to pick that up, but that's how he was taught in the Dominican how to do it and it, it worked really well. He found the tear, no problem, pushed it all the way into the center of the eye and hit the cryo and you could just watch it freeze looking with your eyes. It was quite interesting, so. And so uh, on that day, we did, on that day again, we did Dr. Rage's peel. Uh, I did a vitrectomy, some retained PFO removal, which is pretty common. Um, and then we also did an ROP examination on a baby who was transferred, um, who uh, ended up not having any significant ROP. I think it was probably not where it's a patient that we would actually screen in this country. They were just a little worried. Um, and so, uh, so we took a look, and luckily that baby was clear, and then we did several detachment repairs with buckles. So I got to learn how to do buckles with different equipment, which was good. After, in the afternoon, we spent a little time visiting the, uh, the National Museum with a couple of um, uh, interested uh, residents, and we saw Lucy and Salam, which are the two oldest uh, hominid skeletons in the world, 3.2 and 3.3 million years old. So Salam was a baby, and, um, and uh, his, his remains are there. So that was fun. Day five, we were back in the OR, uh, working with the Ortley. And you can see Dr. Talixu there uh, with Dr. Bernstein. And then we second half, we went to his private clinic. We did uh, a bunch of surgeries. We had some trouble with the Ortley vitrector. Um, it would not have any suction. And we, so we ended up having to abort a couple of cases because of that. But we were still able to do a buckle of vitrectomy for uh, non clearing vitreous hemorrhage and uh, a, the failed uh, PVR complex RD that we weren't able to complete because of the vitrector breaking, which was unfortunate. Then we went to his private clinic and we did several other cases. Um, and uh, and uh, we did a PVR to uh, RD. We did a post-trauma case that uh, Dr. Talixu brought in specifically for us to help with. Um, and uh, um, I was doing part of the case, and so was Dr. Talixu, and we just couldn't get a good view. And luckily, Dr. Bernstein was there to save the day and figure out how we could get a view, and we were able to, to save this kid's eye, so that was exciting. And then did a bunch of total RDs and some, some diabetic hemorrhages. This was an interesting thing. Uh, uh, when we were at Menelik 2, right, at, right, right about at lunchtime, they said, hey, come on in, and they took me into a room literally adjacent to the operating room. And they were roasting coffee over an, an open charcoal flame. So that's something that we might want to think about adding into our OR spaces. <laughs> um, and I guess it's, it's a, kind of a tradition that when you roast and make the coffee, that you're supposed to lean in really close, inhale the smoke, and kind of waft it over your head. So they wanted me to be the ceremonial person to do that since we were visiting to the, that day. And then they made the coffee. So, and very good coffee. Oof. So then we had some time to spend in the countryside and uh, we went to Bahir Dar, which is kind of like the Ethiopian Riviera, but there's actually a lot of history there. So uh, we went to several monasteries that are between fourth and sixth century. Um, and then that's the view from the balcony of the place we were staying. It's on Lake Tana. Um, and uh, this is also the origin of the Blue Nile. So it's the origin of half of the Nile River. So had a good time there. Uh, that is an ancient Bible in Ge Gez, which is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church language. It's very similar to Amharic. Actually, they use the exact same letters, but apparently nobody can read it except the priests because it has a completely different way that everything's arranged. Um, but that is a Bible from about, I think they said about 6th century. And it's made on goat skin, and that's the priest that, uh, that takes care of the, one of the priests that takes care of the monastery. They were nice enough to show us that. And so the top picture is the monastery um, that's obviously been re-roofed. That's, uh, that's a very old monastery from, I think, 450 or so AD. But um, 
it's been redone. And these are the oldest, pr pretty much the oldest monasteries in the, in the country. So very interesting and a lot of fun. Day seven, we went to a place called Lalibela, which is uh, a, uh, um, in the north, also in the north of the country. And um, they basically carved these churches out of solid rock. And uh, you can see um, the bottom left picture is St. George's, which is the most ornate and uh, um, deepest. And the, uh, they actually dug down about 23 meters into solid rock, carved that out, and then dug the inside out. So it's actually from a single, that single piece of stone. And this king, Lalibela, did 11 different churches. So you can see the bottom left is the top where it's a cross, and then you can see on the bottom right, that's what the, that's what the church looks like from a little down on another side. And uh, again, the, the ceilings are, are uh, 20 meters high. And it's three feet of solid, or, uh, sorry, three meters of solid stone on each wall. So it's relatively small inside, actually. But, uh, and then some other churches that were slightly larger, um, again, all monolithic, meaning they were all uh, carved out of, this, out of the mountain. Pretty, rel pretty ornate. And then that's the view. The middle left is the view from the balcony where we were staying. And that's, uh, that's why we were enjoying having a relaxing afternoon when Dr. Bernstein fell asleep. And then day eight and nine, we spent in Aksum, which is uh, the uh, historical capital of Ethiopia. Um, it's where the Aksumite Empire was, which was uh, one of the largest empires in the world um, around its time, which is from about one, uh, 400 BC up until about 9th century AD. Um, and they uh, converted to Christianity in about 300 BC. And uh, the Ethio Ethiopian Orthodox Church believes that they have the original Ark of the Covenant that it was taken from Jerusalem and placed in Ethiopia. Each of the churches has a, um, a copy that's put in the center of the church. That's kind of their altar. And uh, so that's how they say they kept it hidden from anybody who wanted to, to take the Ark of the Covenant as there were so many, they never know, knew where it was, in which church. They say that in that middle picture there, that very small cathedral is where the, the true Ark of the Covenant is placed. And uh, we were lucky enough to just be there on a day. That top picture there is uh, about probably, what do you say, Dr. Bernstein, about 1,000 people, 1,500? Yeah. Uh, people gather at 4.30, and they parade a copy from that, uh, um, from that church around the, the streets of the city. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was quite interesting chanting and kind of parading it through the city about a mile or so. The top left is, the, uh, is from about um, 300 uh, BC, or excuse me, 300 AD, and it's uh, similar to a Rosetta Stone. It's got four sides, and it's got four different languages on the side, and it's a translation stone, and they found that um, and uh, have it erected in a, in a small um, area. And then the bottom left picture is uh, the stelae, which are basically gravestones, grave markers, um, but massive. Um, and they used to put them up for when you died, if you had enough money, you would have your tomb underneath the ground and then you would have this marking the side of your tomb. And they are, the one that fell there, apparently fell right upon erecting is what they think, and it was 82 tons. And they were putting these up in about the fourth to fifth century. So. Pretty interesting that uh, they were able to get those up, but apparently this one fell, and I f felt like that was an engin engineering disaster. They said it wasn't the foundation wasn't deep enough, and so immediately when they put it up, it fell down, which that would not be good. I would be unhappy. And then the last day, we just had about a half day, so uh, we did a quick uh, lecture with the residents, and then we went out to the uh, Amr Hansen uh, Research Institute, which is the leading institute on tuberculosis and or, or, excuse me, um, leprosy in the world. And they also do a lot of work on uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis and drug-resistant tuberculosis. Uh, met Dr. Jonas there, who is a uh, medical researcher and, uh, and geneticist, 
and worked on making sure they had adequate equipment to do DNA sequencing and, and things of that nature for future research projects, collaborating with them. And then we said goodbye to Otis. So uh, the outcome of our trip is that, you know, I think we made a good impact in terms of improving some of the skills of, of the, uh, the, um, the attendings there. But they really need more retina specialists, and they need more people giving retinal services, even if they're not fully trained retina specialists. Um, it would be great for Dr. Derege to come over now that he's starting vitrectomy and he's learning some skills to, to do uh, an observational fellowship with us or somewhere else in the States to uh, get some further training. Um, and then we definitely want to work with the, uh, Alamu more on future trips. We were unable to other than meeting with him briefly one day, we were unable to spend much time with him. Um, and uh, actually, Nick Batra, who most of you know, um, worked with him a lot when he was here. So we thought he would be an ideal candidate if he's interested to go out to spend some one-on-one uh, -on -one time with Dr. Alamu and make sure he has what he needs and, and uh, help with further training. They definitely need photography, OCT, ultrasound, FA if possible capability, certainly OCT. Um, uh, if, if we're able to get it an ultrasound would be um, would be very helpful for them and then they really need a better supply chain so they're not having to cancel a bunch of cases because they don't have attractors and working on projects it sounds like um, maybe this coming fall winter um, they might start a genetics research project on AMD with Greg Hageman but um, they're working on that they still have to we still have to get a bunch of approvals so so questions how do you transport your PFO canisters on airplanes around theory? Um, that checked it wasn't really it wasn't a problem. Really? Yeah. Well, they're small they're small. PFO is liquid though. Yeah. So, okay. PFO is liquid and it's in they're individual containers. So it's just like bringing your soap or shampoo. But there are in terms of actually gases, we've got them into um, into Bhutan. Because the, there's a European version that's pre-filled <coughs> syringes that are not under pressure, and those you can do. They're fairly expensive, though. They're 65 euros a piece. Mm -hmm. So. And interestingly, they use almost exclusively silicone oil because it's so much cheaper there. It's a, it's about forty dollars a a, 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 you know, a bottle for silicone oil, whereas the gas canisters are several hundred. Um, which is kind of just the opposite here, where gas gas is much cheaper than oil. Oil's four to five hundred dollars a and, uh, here in the states because it's got to be FDA approved, so only Alcon can sell it. Just a message for the residents and the fellows: when you go to these countries, don't go with the approach we in the West and you in the developing countries. There are many little tips you can pick up from local surgeons. Remember, they have to make do with little or nothing. Over the years, I've seen some amazing things that people are able to do in these countries. Now, blepharoplasty, we take 45 minutes or so to do it carefully, suture, and I'm on your case when I'm teaching you about how to hold a needle and suture and so on. And in the late 80s, when I was operating not far from where you were with those Coptic churches up north in Ethiopia, they told me about this amazing plastic surgeon that I must go visit. And so I did, and he wasn't was an MD qualified trade, but he was a local surgeon. And he would do a blepharoplasty in about seven minutes. And I thought, that might be true, I want to see this. And so I went and saw his technique, which I'll describe to you in a second. And then he showed me his post-op patients. And I thought, bloody hell, this is as good or better than I can do. And all he would do is he'd lie you down. There was no marking, nothing. He looks at you sitting up. And that is the thing that I always convey to my residents and fellows is examining the patient sitting up ideally joking with them and seeing how they move their faces. And that's what he did. He would simply lie you down, he'd pick up your upper eyelid, he'd go chop. And then he'd take two stitches, one, two, and said, there you are, on your bike. And I thought, that just can't give you a result. And absolutely beautiful result. He tried to publish this, I encouraged him to publish this as his technique. Of course, no Western Medical Journal would accept him. And me being the editor of a couple of plastics, I can't accept it because I'm the one encouraging him ethically, so that never really got published. So we put it together as a little report for the World Health Organization, putting it down as old techniques that may still work type of stuff, but it doesn't give him the importance of his results. And I saw live patients of this. Along the grounds of your retinal detachment, the Honduras technique, 
that you described. Um, in the late 80s, about 88, 89, in, in England we do audits, much more so than you do here. Um, and we compare results, you know, whose rental detection <coughs> rates are where. And it's been, it's been in, in sight you for over since about the mid-60s. In 1989, the person with the highest success rate for retinal detachment repair, this is not using silicone oil, etc. straightforward rental attachments, was um, uh, Bill Dal Dalglish, who trained in South Africa, came to England to practice, and he never used an indirect ophthalmoscope, and he treated all of his detachments with a direct ophthalmoscope. Point of telling the story is, don't lose the skill of examining retinas with a direct ophthalmoscope. And I see a lot of you using 90 and 80 doctor lenses and 20 doctor lenses. <laughs> use, use, use the, use the direct, man. Use the direct ophthalmoscope to see if you missed or if you could have gotten the skill of finding those peripheral lattice degeneration detachment tears, etc. with the direct ophthalmoscope. Because when I'm operating in the bush, I have my direct ophthalmoscope. I use it constantly, and I force myself to use it over here as much as I can. So this gentleman, Dalglish, had something like a 97% success. He would cryo, like you described, <coughs> he'd direct, he'd direct a thermoscope, and he would cryo. And his point was, it's quicker, it's cheaper, it takes care of you as a surgeon with skill, not just as a technician, which is what we've all become, relying on OCTs and all the other stuff. Um, so I was really impressed by those numbers, and I don't know if after his generation, anybody's carried on doing this direct type yeah. of stuff. But he used to teach generation after generation of African surgeons to do that. So this is why you see these people still around the world doing this. Yeah. You know, we mustn't decry it. No. They get incredible results. No, he, he and I learned a lot in terms of buckling and how to adjust the buckle from Dr. Duretta, because that's what they do. You know, we don't do as many straight buckles as they do, certainly, because it's cheaper, faster, easier, and works great when you know how to do it. So, um, What do they use? Do they use silicone? What was that? Do they use silicone now? Do they use silicone? Yeah, no, no, no. Or silicone, silicone. silicone. Uh, mostly they're still using sponges. Okay. They do, we do, we brought them a bunch of silicone bands. They try to reserve any encircling bands or anything for those cases that require 360. So a lot of times they'll even put on a 180 degree sponge and then do a vitrectomy for, for a complex case if they know where the brakes are. So, so there's um, a tree in northern Ethiopia which contains branches with, with bark which has a smooth oily layer on it. That's what they used to use. That's what I'm asking you. Yeah. They were just cut it. No, <laughs> we didn't see that. They use they use regular standard sponges and uh, um, and silicone components. I think so. the irony of all this is these great techniques that they successfully used for decades, they're not, they're not documented anywhere for them. Yes, it's, they're just disappearing. <laughs> so I just wanted to sum up how, you know, what a great job James did on this. And it's really our fellowship here in Retina and with the other fellowships here are unique in that we really emphasize the international division here. And when we're interviewing fellows that are applying here, we're really the only program that does this, that guarantees that every one of our retina fellows will have one to two weeks doing this in the, in the developing world. And we're really trying to get the fellows to be excited about this, to continue doing this when they go on to their, their future jobs. And that's why, you know, Nick Batra, when he heard that we had been there and that we had met with Alamu, really does want to go and is, you know, has, is going to go, even though he's you know, at a different university, will be spon hopefully sponsored by us to go back. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, it's really lucky that we get to do this because it's He's way back. Is anyone else going to go? Like, is it going to be a continued thing? Um, we're just, we try to get yeah. other ones that are, other fellows that are interested. Hopefully yeah, you know, James will the hope would be is that if multiple people can go at multiple different times, you have multiple training opportunities. You have somebody there every three or four months. If you have three people rotating through <coughs> and everybody's going, you get a really good chance to work with these guys, see what they need, assess them, get them what they need in a quick time frame, um, and you know further whatever education needs that they have to uh, to really kind of build up uh, build up the skill set and the availability of services in the country. So you know that would be the ideal is you have several people going 
kind of a, on a rotating schedule to keep improving the skills and the equipment and, and what we have. So. All right. Thanks very much.